Um, I'm Jay Rajendran. I'm a product manager at Firebolt. Um, and this is Rob Harmon, the man in red. So the next time you see red, you're going to think Firebolt. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so the subject of the talk is basically data apps, right? And if you ask about data apps, what you're going to get is a whole bunch of different answers. Uh, what we wanted to do was uh, level set what data apps are, and that's the part that I'm going to be talking about. So I'm the abstract guy, and Rob's the practitioner. So Rob's going to follow out, uh, after me, and he's going to get into you know, how you can position yourselves getting into a data app world. That's the subject of the talk itself, right? So um, getting started here, first of all, this is not new. It's basically an evolution of analytics itself. If you think about analytics, analytics, it's all about different types of workloads. You can uh, think of it in terms of batch, reporting, ELT. You can think in terms of in a traditional BI, right? I think traditional BI is basically the last mile of analytics, if you think about it. But what's next? What's next is basically where we're going with customer-facing analytics. So the last mile just got longer. Now it's a little bit more demanding. That's what we're looking at in terms of you know, data apps, right? So it's customer-facing analytics, how you deliver it, and that's what data apps is all about. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So what is important here is that, sorry, going back. So simply put, just data apps, if you think about it, it's an app that's powered by a data warehouse on the back end. Why a data warehouse? Because data warehouses are great from an enriched data standpoint. They are great in terms of a single source of truth. And that's what you build on. Okay? The question is, you know, how do we deliver it? Okay? I have to go through you know, large amounts of data to get exactly what your customer is looking for. That's really, really hard to do in a data warehouse. And doing it in a very, very fast, responsive manner is absolutely hard. So there are a few attributes you need to think about in terms of a data app when you get into it. First of all, you know, if I'm going to deliver a data app, I need to make it a very packaged experience. So what does packaged mean? Right? Packaged basically means that it should be purpose-built. So understand the use case, tailor it for what the customer is looking for, and deliver it to them. Right? That's the first part. The second part is it needs to be more of a consumer-grade experience. So think of it this way. When you look at an app on your iPhone or whatever, right? You expect that app to be there. You expect the app to be interactive. Can you do the same thing for data? And that's kind of what the data app should be. It should be almost like you know, doing Spotify for you know, your data. That's the experience that you want to be really you know, uh, presenting to your customers. That's the first part. The second part is you know, it needs to be really, really responsive. And that's the hard part that a lot of people forget. Because you have so much data that you've consolidated in a single place, you know, how do you get it to the end user customer? very quickly, right? We'll get to that in a second. And then finally, what's changing is in a traditional BI is all about in a BI teams building in a dashboards and delivering it. But now with data apps, the folks who are delivering those, the data engineering folks working very closely with the app developers. So the mindset is a little bit different. It's more along the lines of how you would do software development itself. Right? That's what you're, you're looking at from a data app perspective. So, Real qu quick, some examples, right? How do you look at data apps from a customer perspective? So we do have different customers who use it. One, you know, how do you monetize data? So it's a data as a product kind of a mindset. So there are customers who do that. For example, if you look at an ad tech, martech space, what do customers do? You know, they're looking at a traffic analysis of you know, stuff coming into their website. They want to know how that compares to somebody else's website. When they sell that data out, when they sell that you know, option of comparing yourself against somebody else, now that's the data as a product. So that, there you go. You have data as a product, and that's a data, data app as well. The challenge there is how do you sift through all that data, right? So that's, that's one aspect. The second thing could be something as simple as how do you augment an existing business model? So I could be a payment processor, right? So I'm, I'm doing payment integration for a whole bunch of merchants. You know, I need to match like, the, the payment instrument with the payment processor, and I provide the workflow for them to do that. But where does the data app in that? The core business model is payment processing, right? The data app comes in when you provide observability into that entire process itself. So that's something that we see as well with our customers. So a payment integration provider who actually provides observability as a data app, that becomes another way to do it. The, the third thing I can think of is, you know, if you're a gaming company, one of the things that you might want to do is you want to know where the inflection points are from an infrastructure standpoint, what's going to break where things are. Is there an anomaly detection that I need to do in terms of infrastructure itself? That is a data app that I could use internally, right? I don't want a, a router 
breaking at the edge, causing an outage for a whole bunch of you know, uh, players, right? So essentially, being able to surface those insights out is actually pretty important on that, on that front. So those are some examples of data apps. But the common thing across all these things is that response time is important, right? So if you think about what the Google study says, 53% of mobile websites are abandoned if you know, the response time lasts you know, more than three seconds. Just think about that. doesn't mean that you have three seconds to respond to a query. It means from an end user perspective, it's three seconds, which means you basically have, from an SLA or a benchmark standpoint, you have less than a second to you know, go get the data, do all the things you have to do, enrich the data, and provide insights back to the customer. That is where the, the difficulty is. Right? So take it another step, right? For us as the data engineers, the problem is it's the response time, but data is continuing to grow, right? It's not gigabytes anymore, it's terabytes, it's tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes. Can you provide that consistent enough sub-second response time even as your data is growing? That is another challenge there. And finally, when you look at performance, it's sub-second performance. Another thing that you really need to measure from a data app perspective is queries per second or concurrency. Right? This is something that we don't really think about. Because when you open the doors to end users in terms of you know, usage on data, now you know, you're doing a lot more than what you actually plan for. What if the number of users grows to 10x? 20x, 100x, what happens to your infrastructure? I'll tell you what happens in the current data warehouses of the world. You know, you, you rely on order scaling because your cluster can only you know, do like eight concurrent queries at a time. You think, so you can throw more infrastructure at it, you can spend more money at it, but where does that stop? So we really need to think about it in terms of how fast can I process data, how many users can I support, how does it scale from a, uh, from a data perspective? So these are some important things. So, so, so what do we do? Typically, as data app builders, we make compromises, right? And then we actually drag our customers along in terms of when we deliver this, they have to you know, work with our compromise that we've made. For example, we may just aggregate data. You can aggregate data into summary tables, common way of doing it, very, very common. But the problem is now you're adding additional workload in terms of more pipelines, a completely separate set of data that probably won't be fresh in the long run. So you're doing all those things as a separate thing as well, right? So these are compromises we do. Maybe you don't analyze you know, one year's worth of data that you present to a customer. Maybe you do two weeks. Why does a customer have to live with that kind of a constraint? What if you can you know, do one year worth of data and be able to you know, give them fast dashboards as well? So these are some of the things that we actually run into from a data app perspective. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're building a data app experience for your customer, really be focused on you know, what you're delivering from a use case standpoint. Build the foundations. The foundations start with the data warehouse, in, in my opinion. It's got to be able to handle that workload in terms of concurrency, in terms of being able to be very efficient in what you process. Guess what? We don't have unlimited budgets, right? So with that, what I want to do is I want to transition over to Rob. And Rob's going to walk you through techniques that you can use you know, to optimize for your data app. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to go through some material here that may be a little vague, but it, it it fits within the Firebolt world. Um, I'll try and make this as simple as, as and easy to understand as I can. So some of these, all of these optimization techniques are Firebolt specific. I have no idea if other products can do something similar, but this is how we handle high concurrency, large data loads against data apps in, in this platform. <clears throat> the, first, the first step is design, data warehouse design. In Firebolt, because we do have extreme performance, we don't, we don't uh, rely on things like denormalization necessarily. We can do joins in real time. We can aggregate gate data in real time. So summary tables are, very, are, are not terribly often used in Firebolt. All of this is based on our unique indexing strategy. We can find data really, really, really fast. And when dealing with data apps, one of the issues that we run into is, well, we're going to want to add new features to this data app. I found that in denormalized structures, it gets very difficult to add new attributes or new entities because now you have to update all the aggregate relations you already have. If we can keep things fairly normalized and simple, we can always add a new attribute to, say, a customer field or a customer table. That's the only place we have to add it because that's where it is. Uh, so we, I generally suggest relying fairly heavily on relational, relational modeling, even in your data warehouse on Firebolt purely because we have that performance. Um, that said, we are going to need a fairly advanced platform to pull this off. The first thing that we do 
in Firebolt is uh, pruning data through clustered index, well, primary indexes. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily use the term clustered here, but close enough. Firebolt has an advanced indexing uh, platform. Uh, it's very different than the partitions that we're used to in other cloud data warehouses. We're using vectorized indexes on the data itself. The data is stored in very, very small parts. That way, when I run a query, I don't have to bring that whole partition over the wire, figure out where the rows are I, that I need in that partition, which are generally fairly sparse, you know, they, or fairly, the, the rows I need are not gonna be very many in that, in that partition. So we're dragging a bunch of unnecessary data around. In Firebolt, our parts are really tight and highly dense. So when we fire a query, the query optimizer knows exactly where the data I need is. So I'm moving much less data across the wire into the compute. Um, and of course, with less data, I'm using less compute, I'm using less memory. <coughs> um, here we've got an example of how we kind of cluster up those, those, those indexes. As, as data comes in, we, we lay them down in these little parts. As new data is added, we sort that out so the parts are all tight, so I know employee ID one is right next to employee ID two, et cetera, physically. Um, now, when we deal with partitions in, on other platforms, those rows could be in very strange places, so retrieving them is hard. Uh, in Firebolt, this is really it to, uh, to the syntax for indexing. You create a table, it's a standard ANSI create table statement. We just have an extra keyword at the, at the end that says primary index and the fields you want to index. Obviously, we're going to want to index by things that are commonly used in predicates, oftentimes uh, in joins as well, because a join is a predicate. Much of this is not new. All of this, the, the same basic strategies we used on, on uh, relational databases like SQL Server, MySQL, et cetera, work beautifully here. Um, From there, we can do some advanced things in Firebolt. Um, one of the problems we always run into in the cloud data world is large joins, fact-to-fact -fact joins. I've got a billion rows here and a billion rows there. Trying to put them together is hard. One of the things we can do with Firebolt to kind of sidestep this a little bit, we have a very strong array capability in Firebolt, and we can, uh, we can then effectively pre-join. And what I mean by that, is taking attributes from different rows in the same table, maintaining an index behind the scenes that has an array of those values I'm looking for for that key. Uh, for instance, if I'm doing clickstream analysis, I can have you know, the keys of my clickstream and then the event type. So if it's a click, if it's a, an impression, if it's uh, a conversion, et cetera, all in that array. And then when I go to look for click fraud, I can just look for any row where in that array I have a conversion, but no, uh, no ads shown. There I know I have got click, click fraud all in one place without joining the table to itself. Um, so as an example, we've got these two tables. Here is uh, an aggregate using, uh, um, using a, a full table to table join. We've all seen these. We can do the exact same thing in Firebolt by using an aggregate. Here we are with my array function using index of to pull those arrays out. The, the query achieves the exact same thing without that massive join. Uh, and then I kind of touched on it, aggregating indexes, uh, but this is one of the really great features of, of Firebolt. Aggregating indexes are kind of a, a half breed between a functional index and uh, a materialized view. We can define these things fairly straightforward. The, the DDL is right in front of you. Select, key field, key field, key field, aggregate, aggregate. And what will happen is as I'm bringing that raw data in, could be millions, billions of rows, an hour, we don't mind, that aggregating index is maintained automatically. Now, it's highly efficient. It's only going to touch the nodes in that aggregate, aggregating index that it needs to when a row comes in. So if I've got two rows that came in from five o'clock yesterday, it's not gonna reprocess all of the five o'clock yesterday data. It's only gonna touch those nodes that fit those rows. So cost on ingestion is very, very low. But as you can imagine, 
if I can create an indexing scheme based on an aggregate, the number of nodes in that index are gonna be drastically smaller than the number of nodes in the, in the raw table. The other thing this does for me is it takes some manpower out. Um, we no longer have to build summary tables because that's just handled by the aggregating index. There's no need for it. This removes that dev time necessary for building those aggregates. Uh, the last thing that I think is important here is it removes the possibility of update anomalies. We've all seen this. You have a database table, you've got an aggregate table sitting on top of it. That aggregating table, for whatever reason, doesn't get updated quite the same. Since we're dealing with aggregate indexes and everything is built into the system, all those anomalies go away, all those bugs go away. <clears throat> oh, examples here. And then the last thing that we do often is accelerating up certs with partitions. This is very, very common amongst the entire data warehouse world, as I'm sure you know. It's a lot easier to maintain uh, a, a table full of, of partition identities, we, and please excuse me, I should explain. Partitions do exist in Firebolt, but they're not physical. They just identify those parts that belong to a partitioning scheme. Um, and here we can create a table, add a partition scheme by DT, uh, and then insert into our destination table. You'll notice here I've got a view that's selecting from my de tar destination table uh, where it does not exist in, uh, in the partitions that I want destroyed. So I can filter before I destroy the partitions to keep things very, very quick, and then on a daily cleanup schedule, physically get rid of those, par those partitions. Um, and then the last thing that we do get into in Firebolt, we have very strong support for JSON data. So we can maintain both tabular and JSON data in the same table. So we can index by tabular columns in our primary indexing. We can also then use JSON structures for table evolution. We've all seen it. We've got a table, we need a new field, well, we can, can go through the, the whole process of altering a table or dropping and recreating the table to, to achieve that goal. It's oftentimes much easier to, to set that data in a JSON structure, let Firebolt in, ingest it as JSON, and then just extract it at query time. JSON structures in Firebolt are extremely fast, so we don't always have to bring things out into tabular, tabular mode. Uh, here is the basic syntax for extracting from JSON. It's not really... Uh, difficult, we have some JSON extract functions. You'll also notice uh, down here, uh, we have very advanced uh, 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 array handling capabilities uh, using Lambda functions, believe it or not, built right into the system. Uh, so once you put Lambda functions and arrays together, and you stack that up with aggregating indexes, you can actually do some really amazing things with these three very, very small pieces. <coughs> So we're back to kind of the beginning. It's built for developers and data engineers. It's built to performance scale, uh, and it is a modern cloud native data architecture, so everything you expect, like decoupled storage and compute, et cetera, exists. Uh, we've got a basic overview here. Um, compute, compute in Firebolt is, is infinitely configurable. There's no t-shirt sizing, no small, medium, and large. Any node type that's available in Amazon is available in Firebolt to use. All the pricing is, is direct, transparent in the interface so you know what you're paying per hour, all the billing's hourly, and you can configure anywhere from one to 128 nodes per engine so we can really tune this down to your exact work, workload. Um, oh, hey, off to demo time. So what I've got in front of, in front of us for a demo, this is a, a query that actually came to us by a customer. They're in the ad tech business. This query was under, Un, under their previous platform, this query was running minutes. Uh, the data under here is uh, a little heavy. It's ad tech data, so it's gonna be heavy. If we look at it, we can see we've got this LTV table, which is what? 57 billion rows long, uh, 31 terabytes in size. We've got two lookup tables here. 144,000 rows and 72,000 rows, respectively. 
this is really the base of this query. Now, if we go through this query, uh, we can see it's very straightforward, ANSI SQL. Um, we start with the CTV pulling from that big table. We join it to the other two tables. And you know, earlier I mentioned primary indexing. This query is interesting because of the workload on the data set. We can't join to the primary index on this query. The, we needed the, the index on another field for another query. So here we're joining off index. But we can handle that in Firebolt because we have effectively covering indexes. We call them join indexes. And they work just like, uh, like a covering index in a B-tree style system. Uh, from there, we select a bunch of fields, and we do a bunch of group buys, um, add some interesting predicates at the bottom, and because of the magic of Firebolt, we hit the go button. Now, it's busy sending it across the internet. Believe it or not, the query's already done. Um, there we go. Let me try that one more time. There we are. So Firebolt doesn't cache, so the difference you saw between the two runs is not caching, because we can't do that. Um, but you can see the query comes back in 0.37 seconds. So we went from minutes to 0.37 seconds on this by using these indexing schemes, these aggregating schemes, uh, and, and really leveraging what a cloud data warehouse, I believe, should be able to do. Now, the 0.37 seconds might look impressive. I believe the more impressive number is this number here, 3.2 gig. So out of that 30 some odd terabytes of data, I only needed to touch 3.2 gig to get to the, the answer I needed there. This is really what can, what can drive the idea of data apps. Um, the one other thing I would kind of touch on here is Firebolt is built to be uh, almost, excuse me, built to have almost unlimited concurrency. We don't have mail slots. We don't have those limitations. And as you bring your query response time down, concurrency gets even easier. If I run, if I have, say, a 10 user or a 10 concurrent query limit, and my queries are running at one second, obviously I can only run 10 queries per second. If I can bring that down to 10 milliseconds, obviously I can go 10 times fast or 100 times faster. You get the idea. That's part of what makes Firebolt cool. The last thing I wanted to show you is just basic administration of the product. Firebolt, Cloud Data Warehouse, data and compute are not connected. So our, our largest container is the database itself. It contains data. And you can see in this case, it's only 1.81 terabytes. That's because we did leverage that compression I mentioned earlier on that 30 terabyte table or set of tables to bring it down. We don't charge for storage. Amazon does, so we just pass it through a ter what, 1.8 ter, that's gonna be 23 bucks a month per ter, so 38 bucks for a database this size. And then from there, we add compute. And you can, as I mentioned, you can add whatever compute you'd need. In this case, I've got an ingestion engine and then a number of analytics engines. The ingestion engine is used for bringing data in. In this case, it's an hourly ingestion cycle, so I went a little big on the ingestion engine. So 20 bucks an hour for ingestion. It was bigger than what the customer needed, but since I go with a big engine, the ingestion just happens that much faster at the beginning of the hour. Since we're in the cloud and compute, its time is relative to money, so if I can do it in 30 minutes on a $10 engine or 15 minutes on a $20 engine, may as well do the, the, the larger engine. And then I can separate analytics engines based on their workload. Now, just because we're talking about data apps here doesn't mean that's all this data warehouse does. We're gonna have an internal um, an analytics team that's also working on the same data because we put all our data in a data warehouse for that purpose, one version of the truth. We may have numerous internal teams working on this. Now, if I have customer-facing applications as well as internal applications, I don't want anything to upset that customer facing system. So I can put them on their own engine to defend them against our internal users who may be writing inefficient queries. Um, so we can break these down pretty easily that way. Now, each of these engines are, as I mentioned, highly configurable. Um, we can pick any node type that, that uh, S3 has. From there, you can see scaling is as easy as sliding the bar from one to 128. All of the 
All the pricing you can see here is completely transparent, so an engine configured that way is gonna cost me 10 bucks an hour. All of our billing is by minute, so if I keep an engine up for 15 minutes, it costs me a quarter of what you see here. And that's really um, my presentation for today. Thank you for your time.